The message is, it's about dogs and cats. Um, and in fact, we've polled this, and I'll show you the polls in a little bit. Um, but here's a crib sheet on HSUS. It's not about dogs and cats. It's run by vegans, a lot of former staffers for PETA. They've got a huge mailing list. They've got a no animal products in the workplace policy for their executive suite. You can't wear leather shoes and work for Wayne Pacelli. Um, there's a huge overhead. They, like I showed you, they spent 24% of their money on fundraising, almost 38% on salaries. But here's the thing, they, are, they have no legal affiliation with any pet shelter anywhere. They don't run any pet shelter anywhere. They're not an umbrella group for pet shelters anywhere. <laughs> and they hardly give any money at all to pet shelters anywhere. You wouldn't get that watching that, that TV commercial. Uh, the percentage of, of their actual money they got from the public, the, their, their budget in 2008 that they passed through, and they said, here's some money, Humane Society of DeKalb County, Georgia, here's some money, SPCA of Brooklyn. The amount of money they actually put in, anybody want to hazard a guess to a percentage? 2%, keep going down. Anybody else? Half a percent, you're very, very close. 45 one hundredths of a percent. That's how much of their money they actually shared with local humane societies in 2008. <laughs> Imagine if the American Red Cross collected $10 million for Haiti relief. And then you found out that oh, only a half a percent of that money actually went to the chapters that went to Haiti. And just as an example, there would be a congressional investigation. There would be hell to pay. Heads would roll. I don't know why it's not happening. Lesson number six, Wayne Pacelli. Get to know this guy's face. <laughs> if you want to stay in business, he's the biggest enemy you have. It's not Dean Flores. It's not PETA. It's not Nava, it's, not, it's, it's, it's Wayne Pacell. He's a very, very smart politician. I, I, I work in Washington, three blocks from the White House, and I see very few politicians in Washington who are as polished and as slick as this guy. He's very, very well-spoken. But he's not a stakeholder. <laughs> you couldn't get him to eat the most humanely raised piece of veal on the planet. Wouldn't happen. In fact, I testified in a Farm Bill hearing a couple of summers ago and I offered him. He was on the table right next to me. And I said, Mr. Pacelli, I want to invite you to have dinner on me. I'll share it with you. Uh, you tell me what the most humanely raised veal or pork is in the world. And I'll buy it. And we just sit and eat together in front of 10 cameras. What do you say? He won't do it because he doesn't believe there is such a thing as humanely raised animal protein. To him, it's a dogma. It's almost like a religion. The idea, and that's fine. He's entitled to it, by the way. It's, this is America. You can be a vegetarian, a libertarian, a unitarian. I, more power to you, I don't care. What, object, what I object to personally and what the Center for Consumer Freedom has a problem with are, is the suggestion in all of their direct mail pieces, in all of these TV ads, that they're a puppy and cat shelter group. Because they're not. They're, they're, a more, they're a richer PETA with no naked interns. <clears throat> and here's, here's Wayne Pacelli's coalition building. This is right out of Washington. This is what your, your members of the House and Senate do. They build coalitions with like-minded groups from different sectors. This is, again, Mr. Pacelli in one of those unguarded moments. Um, as, you'll, as you'll see through this presentation, they're not the only guys with hidden cameras, and sometimes it's worth doing. So industrial agriculture has to be a focus for this movement, and it just so happens that not only do we have a devastating critique of the abuses of animals in industrial agriculture, where pigs are housed in gestation crates, and hens are in battery cages, and young male cats are in field crates, but we also have extraordinary abuses of slaughterhouse workers. We have extraordinary pollution of the environment because of all the concentration of animal waste in these industrial factory farms. We would be foolish and silly not to unite with people in the public health sector, the environmental community, uh, unions to try to challenge corporate agriculture. So he's basically saying, look, I'll use any tool in the book if it means I can put you out of business, if it means I can reduce the number of people who are eating and drinking what you produce. He'll use environmental groups. He'll ally with labor unions to create labor problems for you. Why? Because he's smart. That's what you do in Washington. You use every tool in, in, in your arsenal, and you'd be stupid to leave a loaded weapon on the table. Why not use it? So I just want you to understand how smart he is. <laughs> in some ways, I think you, know, you might consider him like the Rahm Emanuel of the animal movement. Uh, and by that I mean this, <clears throat> and, and remember I, I put up the slide with this particular rule saying he's, he's a politician, not a stakeholder. Here's what I mean by that. Um, imagine, <clears throat> keep in mind that Wayne Pacelli has been going around to agriculture all over the country saying, 
we want to help you. We want to work with you. We want to make you better. We want to make you more better stewards of your animals. And so we want to make you better. We want to improve agriculture. Imagine if Rahm Emanuel called up Michael Steele at the Republican National Committee and said, hey, Mike, why don't you invite me in to speak to your conference? I want to help you get better. I want to help you win in November. I want to make you a more effective Republican Party. Click, right? That would be the end of that conversation because they know instinctively in Washington that Rahm Emanuel doesn't want to improve the Republican Party. He wants to bury it. He wants it in the ground. He wants it as ineffective as possible. And he wants to remove its ability to defend itself and promote its platform. Wayne Pacelli is Rahm Emanuel here. He comes and puts his armor on your shoulder and says, I want to improve you. No, he doesn't. He wants you dead. He wants your business dead anyway. Uh, this is a guy who doesn't deserve a seat at the table precisely because his fondest wish is to reduce the table to toothpicks. He's not a stakeholder. The vegans are not stakeholders in animal agriculture. They're outside the system looking in. That makes them critics, and occasionally they might have something useful to say, but that's a very different thing from being a stakeholder. <laughs> Lesson number seven. Like it or not, you're at war. Hate to break it to you. There are some people in this room who would like to not be at war with the animal rights movement. I understand that. Neville Chamberlain didn't want to be at war with Hitler, you know, but Winston Churchill understood the stakes. You have a choice whether you're going to engage in this war or not, but you're in it. You can sit there and take it or you can engage. Remember that, uh, that tax return I showed you? Here's another line from it, from their 2008 tax return. They put over two and a half million dollars in their executive pension plans in 2008. Now that tells me one thing. They plan to be around agitating long enough to retire on these benefits. This is not a short-term deal. This is that 50 or 60 year plan to veganize America, or at least to get closer before they kick off. And they're putting money every year into their pension plan. Since Wayne Pacelli took over at the Humane Society of the United States, eight and a half million bucks in their executive pension plans. <laughs> Two and a half million dollars last year was more than my entire organization's budget. I mean, that's how much money they're putting off in their pension plan. They're in this, this is an endless war. And you can't possibly satisfy them. You, you, some of you may have heard the story, and I don't think I'm telling tales out of school, that a bunch of, of egg producers here in California invited Wayne Pacelli to look recently to look at a, at a cage that they had developed that they thought would comply with Proposition 2. And a, a, reportedly, Mr. Pacelli's response was, no, I, don't you know by now, I'm not going to be satisfied with any cage. They keep moving the goalposts. Today it's cage-free. Tomorrow it's, well, cage-free is not really humane. You're still taking the chicken's egg. I mean, come on. They're, they keep moving the goalposts. So no matter what you do, if you think you can pacify, satisfy, or accommodate them, it will never, ever be enough. Here's Josh Balk again from HSUS saying, in effect, listen to him. He says, look, if, if anybody tells you this cage-free thing is humane, it's not. Yeah, I, I, want, I want everyone in this room to know, uh, again, and, and that's a great question, that if anyone says a cage-free is 100% humane, 100% cruelty-free, just know that's not accurate. It just simply is not accurate. So as a policy position, th that's not good enough for them. Cruelty-free to them means that you don't eat the egg, you don't take it from the chicken. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that you get rid of the cage. It doesn't mean that you, certainly doesn't mean that you relocate to Guadalajara if you're an egg producer. <laughs> Lesson number eight, we're nearing the end of the lessons, I promise. Public opinion is everything, everything. If you can persuade the public that you're not the bad guy, or alternatively, if you can persuade the public that the Humane Society of the United States is playing a little game of political hide the ball, you're gonna be much, much better off. Here's some polling, and this is all legitimate national polling. The first couple are from Gallup. 25% of Americans right now believe that, America, that animals deserve the same rights as people. Almost two-thirds believe that they should pass strict laws regarding uh, treatment of farm animals. <laughs> and 83% of Americans, and this poll is very, very recent, just a few weeks old. Uh, we commissioned this from Opinion Research Corp, who do the political reporting for CNN. 83% uh, of Americans like the Humane Society of the United States. I would say it's mostly because of the name. If you don't like them, you must be in favor of inhumane treatment of animals. And also because Americans don't know what they are. 71% of Americans, again, we polled this two weeks ago, believe that HSUS is, and I quote, an umbrella group that represents thousands of local humane societies all across America. 71% of Americans are dead wrong. 
63% believe that their local humane society is affiliated with HSUS. They're all wrong. There is no such affiliation anywhere. 59% believe HSUS contributes most of its money, not a little, but most of its money, to local organizations that care for cats and dogs. That, again, is not correct. In 2008, it was less than one half of 1%. It wasn't most of its money by any stretch. What I'm saying is that HSUS, through its clever marketing and its crafty fundraising campaigns, and its marketing tie-ins and its Hollywood connections, has persuaded most of Americans of something that's a complete myth.